Today, as you can see, we have a very prestigious panel here on the dais. And I believe we are talking about one of the key issues of this summit. And that is, how do we finance Myanmar's future in a sustainable way? Let me introduce the panelists very briefly. It is a huge honor to have the Finance and Revenue Minister of Myanmar here with us today. He's also recently been promoted to assume ministerial level duties for investments. So congratulations, Minister, for that. And uh, we very much look forward uh, to your insights on the aspirations you have for Myanmar and on your thoughts on how you will achieve that. Peter Meher, I'll just go one direction. Uh, he runs Visa for most of Asia. And uh, Visa, as you may again know, has already begun uh, activity in Myanmar. And he can share with us some of the mechanisms uh, and also share his significant expertise on financial inclusion as they practice around many emerging markets. We then go to Uthan Win, who is from the KBZ Bank chairman, and he will bring the local flavor, uh, having operated here, and he can also talk to us about um, the operational challenges and opportunities that Myanmar presents. Next, we have Secretary Abad from the Philippines, and he will bring to us a regional perspective and a knowledge of what a fast-growing financial market looks like and what this might mean for Myanmar. Again, as you are all very aware, Philippines is the current flavor and favorite of the world. They have recently been upped to investment grade, and congratulations for that, Secretary. Next, we have John Frederick Baxas who is the president and CEO of Telenor. Uh, Telenor has been very successful in new emerging markets. They are very active in the neighborhood here. So we will get some very good insights onto alternative financing uh, from his experience and what the future of banking and communication put together might look like. And last but not least, we have Tiranun Sri Hong, who is the co-president Kasekon Bank Public Company from Thailand, and he can give us a regional viewpoint and also make the comparisons, uh, which will be of huge interest to us between Thailand and Myanmar being neighbors, but in a slightly different point in the cycle of economic growth and development. In terms of structure, I'll be asking our panelists for the initial thoughts on the core topic, and then we will open up the floor for questions, which you can field to the panel. We will then turn back to another conversation and discussion on the panel. And then hopefully we might have some time at the end for a final couple of questions. Let me set the scene here. Today we have been asked to address the question of how with less than one-fifth of Myanmar's population using formal financial systems, can the country build the foundations of an inclusive and robust financial system? This is a unique moment to have this conversation. Myanmar is an exciting country. Multinationals have long since spotted the economic potential of this vast country with its young population. Myanmar is not only rich in natural resources, such as oil, gas, and timber, but it's also strategically located between China, India, and ASEAN. It has been noteworthy that the government has shown willingness to draw upon skills and resources from the outside in order to open up Myanmar's economy. This is particularly seen in the work underway to build a modern financial system. The speed and relative ease with which we opened our representative office earlier this year in Yangon is one very good evidence of that very open and progressive mindset of the government in Myanmar. That said, doing business in Myanmar is still not easy, something our clients are telling us. 
The financial system is at an early stage of development. At a retail level, very few people have bank accounts, less than 10%, I guess. And the speed of legal and regulatory change, along with skill shortages, creates uncertainty. And we cannot ignore that targeted US sanctions against Myanmar remain in place, including in key areas such as financial services. However, we need to recognize that Myanmar government has opened up much faster than many would have expected. Exchange rate unification is a good example. The opening of the telecom license process to foreign players is another. Banking sector liberalization is shaping up and is very much on the radar. And it's also important that Myanmar is already a market economy. All this set a positive foundation. I, did now, I would now like to turn to the panel to get their thoughts. And may we have the privilege of beginning with you, Your Excellency, the Minister. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Singh. And all the distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'd like to express my heartfelt thanks to all of you for getting the chance to be here with you, all of us. Actually, this is the first international forum in Myanmar's why. That's why not only for me, on behalf of our Myanmar people, I'm very honored to be here with the, the very uh, auspicious forum here. So nowadays, all, all can see very clear, clear, Myanmar is now seems to be the center of global attention since our government took office in 2011. But we are trying and we are going underway uh, and also we have undertaken so many significant reforms process. During this reform process, Strictly concern for me is the financial sector's reform also. I'm very happy to be here because I will get a chance to share or to be share the experience to the, our financial sector's development. So today I hoped we can get us some consensus solutions what we are doing for the future, especially concerning about our financial sector's development. Thank you. Minister, as has been everyone's experience who has met with you or anyone else in the government, you remain unassuming and full of humility uh, to be still learning and gathering from others. But thank you for that. May I now turn to Secretary Abad uh, from the Philippines to hear from him. Thank you. Thank you for uh, the opportunity to uh, be in this uh, forum. The Aquino administration came into power at the back of a very intense desire of people for uh, good governance and the reduction of uh, poverty. And that's why financial inclusion uh, you know, is, is, is key to uh, promoting uh, greater equity in, uh, in our society. And uh, right now it's... Uh, it's still a serious challenge uh, for the Philippines uh, to promote greater inclusivity in this area. Uh, but uh, our recent experiences with delivering social uh, programs has convinced us about the many advantages of uh, moving uh, in this direction, particularly the benefits of uh, greater efficiency, um, uh, greater inclusion, as well as uh, greater transparency and uh, accountability in uh, the delivery of services by uh, government. So uh, we believe that uh, a more vigorous push in this direction is going to help grow the economy uh, further, especially since uh, the Philippines enjoys a high degree of uh, credibility in so far as its uh, policy and regulatory framework for uh, finance. So uh, there, there is, uh, despite the challenges, uh, the silver, silver lining is there, you know. Uh, there are great uh, opportunities that's available to further move in that direction. Secretary, um, I mean, Philippines is one of the 
best examples of financial inclusion uh, among other countries in the world. And uh, they also, I believe, are one of the most sms countries in the world uh, among their uh, citizens and uh, residents. Um, that leads me on nicely to John, uh, who can talk to us about mobile telephony. Yeah, thank you, and uh, Your Excellency, and um, everyone else, thank you for the opportunity. And also, really, thank you to uh, World Economic Forum that uh, basically have kept their um, finger on this topic for quite a number of sessions. Um, the optimism around uh, financial services through the mobile phone is strong in, uh, in most markets and has a phenomenal potential. However, uh, the examples of a full-fledged uh, financial services in the mobile phone are sort of on big scale. Uh, haven't really got out of the bottle yet. So in a way, there are uh, still uh, uh, a way to go to say that the full formula has been found. Um, but the strength of uh, inclusiveness uh, in order to achieve uh, greater economic equality uh, among every uh, person in the, in the market is, uh, is very, very strong. And that comes first and foremost by connectivity as such. And uh, to be included or to, mo to not be included, that is uh, sort of the big difference. And on this occasion, I can't uh, refrain from taking an example. When we opened a um, connectivity in a, a local marketplace in a neighboring country, and the first uh, person that got the mobile phone in that area came over to me and said, um, uh, we had, I had used my Norwegian phone, and I had called to, uh, to this person on the, lo on the local number. And then the person came over to me and said, uh, please, Mr. Baxos, may, please make sure that I am the only one that have a mobile phone in my area. <laughs> because she, uh, in that uh, case, became the, the hub of all information. So uh, immediately it was understood that when you are in control of information, you are also in, in control of uh, value add. And I think that goes for uh, the, the, the financial aspect as well. Uh, because it's so uh, easily understood that if you can participate in economic life uh, through uh, being able to carry out transactions through your mobile phone in its simplicity, um, uh, domestic uh, money transfers, for example, to begin with, then you are actually building capacities which you didn't have before. And you reduce the, the traveling time, you reduce all kind of practicalities, uh, it's there because uh, there is a, an outlet that you can trust and you're willing to put your money in. And there is another guy in the other end that basically takes them out again. And there is a security mechanism that the, the mobile phone carriers basically uh, implement in their systems. So then we're back to the trust factor. Um, and mobile carriers, to a certain extent, has that trust factor because people buy their uh, airtime up front and then they take out the benefit of airtime uh, successively. And then there is suddenly not a difference whether you put some money in uh, at one point of time and potentially take some money out later on because you, it's, it's your money, it's your airtime. And that is, in a way, the simple philosophy behind it. And one more thing, uh, since we have um, a cooperative bank uh, of ours just next, next to me in, in Thailand, uh, where we started together the ATM SIM, extending the banking services into the hands of the mobile phone. Uh, and that means that, uh, in a way, the bank, in this case, was looking at the mobile phone as an extended branch uh, the only thing it couldn't do was to print money uh, physically. Uh, but you could, you could do everything else that it could do from an ATM in that sense. So the potential is there. Uh, however, it is also a lot of practicalities, also on the regulatory side, to get it done. Thank you, John. We've had experience as an institution working with Telenor in many countries, including some very close to uh, Myanmar. And, um, all I can say, John, is I wish you all the best for the bidding in Myanmar. I hope you're active here as well very soon. Let's move on to Peter from Visa. And uh, Peter, you're already active here, so. 
Sure. So I'll talk a little bit about the experience that we've had over the last, you know, six or seven months since we uh, signed up with a number of uh, Myanmar banks. The first order of business for Visa is opening up card acceptance so that international visitors can use their card in the country. And uh, we've had to be quite creative in finding solutions to the infrastructure challenges that we have. However, uh, if you put your, your mind to it, these things can be done. There are challenges which can be overcome. We've got a couple of hundred ATMs. The one that you see in the conference here was installed a few days ago and is working most of the time. But this is Myanmar. It's working most of the time. I got two transactions done. Uh, we have a couple of hundred uh, retailers, hotels and restaurants, etc., accepting cards today. This will continue. It will roll out. It will become bigger. Um, I was just looking at the numbers before I came here. We've had about 50,000 ATM transactions for international visitors, about $7 million dispensed, which has gone straight into the uh, Myanmar economy. Uh, now, where are we going? Of course, if you look at your near neighbor who has a very successful tourism industry in Thailand, international visa card holders will spend $6 billion in Thailand this year, a little bit over $6 billion. So that's the opportunity. Card acceptance will help the tourism industry in this country and bring some new skills around electronic uh, payment services. So that's the first point. So we're making progress on that and we're quite pleased with where we've got to in a relatively short time given the challenges that we have around power and telephone lines, etc. So we're very eagerly looking forward to uh, the telco licensing round and, and uh, to see the winners roll out um, a telecommunications backbone uh, in the country. I think the, uh, the other area, that's the sort of traditional visa business, if you like. The, the other side, which is the non-traditional business, which is kind of amplifying what my colleague from Telenor was talking about. You, you know, we were in this digital era. We have some fantastic opportunities to reach parts of the community that the banks won't reach uh, because the, their cost structure is different than the cost structure that you have in some of these mobile money schemes that we see increasingly around the world. And they are reaching, you know, hundreds of millions of people who had no f access to financial products before. They are basic financial products, basic services, but they, they address the, the convenience. Uh, poor people, you know, don't have much time either to do certain things. And they're simple and they can be understood. Because I think one of the challenges as we get into a bank or a financially included uh, uh, community here is basic uh, education and knowledge. Um, so we find that one of the things that we do more of is training. So we have seven banks here. We work very well with the banks and the central bank to educate and pass on the knowledge that we've picked up uh, in our experience around the world. And we find that the folks here are very eager to learn, very eager to learn. So we're very encouraged by that. But this opportunity to build a policy framework which will rocket fuel the mobile money, I think is, a, is, a, is an area which the government should really focus on and try and get that right. Because if you can get that policy framework right, great things can happen. And we've seen these schemes, and I know John is all over the world with Telenor, he's been part of them. Uh, we've seen in some countries where the regulations are in place, the schemes go very well. And you can get around to building up trust and confidence in the community and you really get behind these schemes. Where the regulations aren't appropriate or a bit clunky or clumsy, the schemes don't go as fast as they could. So I think if there was one area which I think the government should focus on is that policy framework. There are lots of uh, experts from World Bank, CGAP, AFI, you name it, who have a lot of learnings uh, under their belt. And I think, uh, I know you are talking to them and uh, I know your, your sort of regulations are coming soon and uh, we're sort of eagerly anticipating that. But I think with the expansion of the banking sector, which is happening, everyone we talk to is putting out more branches, the traditional way, and then the e-money and mobile money and the technology which is coming, I think you've got a great opportunity to do things quickly uh, in this country in a matter of years, not decades. And so, you know, when we talk about cash and, and people in Vietnam still prefer gold and bank accounts, and they're 20 years into it, I think we have an opportunity here to make uh, very quick progress. Thank you, Peter. Uh, the best example I know in uh, our part of the world where the economy moved in a very short period from cash to plastic is Korea uh, in a very short time. 
and they did it because they provided tax incentives on uh, transacting on plastic rather than on cash. And uh, I guess that's another uh, idea the credit card companies will be uh, suggesting to, to the minister here and to his government. Um, let me now turn to uh, Tiranan from Thailand. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, let me shift the gear a little bit because I'm, I'm a traditional banker and, and I look at this kind of thing from also from the risk perspectives. I think uh, the key to economic development is you need to have a, a, a robust, uh, a efficient and competitive <coughs> private sectors creating jobs, uh, providing services to citizens, and also uh, paying tax for country development. Uh, so I, I think Myanmar needs to get to the basic right on banking system first, and which is uh, how do you allow, would allow private sector to prosper through an efficient financial services. And that is to reduce waste into the systems, in the systems right now, creating efficiencies. So actually my first advice is to work on payments work on efficient payment system, efficient clearing and settlement systems, and then also working on the deposit sides of banking, creating confidence, because people, I mean, there are money, a lot of money in Myanmar right now that are not circulating in the banking systems. People just don't trust bank, let alone, I mean, trusting that your money in the mobile phone will be you then in the end can really be used if there's no proper regulatory platform to ensure them that once they put the money somewhere and that you can get it back. So it is, my, my idea would be a, to first working on a robust banking infrastructures and that, that comprise a lot of, of issues to be discussed, uh, work on payment, deposits, and maybe insurance, because insurance will give a large number of populations a protection for their financial safety if anything happens to them. A lot has been said about microcredit and the credits that's given in, on mobile phone and all that. To me, I think that's too advanced things to think about because credit is complicated. And once you talk about credit, you need to have a proper risk management system and risk supervision, which is a complicated things to, to build on. Uh, so uh, my quick thinking right now is, is work on the basic infrastructures, uh, getting more people to be in the banking system by creating confidence, creating trust, and, and we can talk a lot more about that. Thank you. Thailand, of course, boasts a very progressive and sophisticated banking system. So it's uh, the closest neighbor as well. So a lot to learn and to uh, give and take from Myanmar. Uthadwin, we purposely kept you for last <laughs> since uh, we said you would be able to talk really about uh, what the priority should be for the banking system here, being a local uh, chair of, of, of the very well-flourishing bank here, uh, but also what have you learned from the past in terms of your experience, the good things and the opportunities that might be there? Thank you, uh, and uh, good afternoon, everybody, President. Uh, and and uh, the, the fact that uh, the uh, our banking system is still going un undergoing uh, a learning process, uh, I just want to get things that the, you know, to look back, what we are just uh, trying to trans transform the, the banking system. Uh, the, just before I came here, uh, we, we, we were, you know, the, uh, we, are, uh, we came across with the uh, GSCN and, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the TV crew at group. Uh, they came along and they said, uh, we want to have uh, some TV shots. In, uh, so we permitted them to, we showed them the, our main uh, branch with the bank. 
And they were surprised to find that a lot of cash are piling up, you know, the, you never see before in other countries. So uh, the, the cash culture itself is uh, ingrained in us. You know. It's because uh, you remember, uh, if you uh, keep on remembering, because we nationalized all the foreign banks, 14 foreign banks existed, and then the domestic banks in 1963. That was the end of the uh, modernization uh, process. And because of that, uh, the, the people itself, uh, you know, they are far away from the banking system. Until 1993, when we uh, first uh, permitted the private banks to open up, uh, I was with the central bank at the time, and uh, we we were on the point of uh, liberalization of all, all the uh, the financial services at the time. And uh, even at the time, we already have permitted the private, some of the private banks to uh, to issue the credit cards. Uh, but uh, because of the financial, uh, you know, the Asia financial crisis all these reforms were put to a stop. Uh, but then along, the, with the present governments uh, coming into the picture, we also have this uh, liberalization measures uh, to continue again. And uh, right now, uh, some of those uh, are cautioning us, you know, if you keep on by the, uh, opening the branches, there'll be nobody is coming to the bank because uh, in fact, uh, the, the people are so much used to the cash culture they, 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 may, they may not think it's coming to the bank. And we said uh, it's okay because we, at least uh, we did uh, some service to the, to, to the country. At least uh, it may be a loss to us uh, by opening new branches. But then along, when we try to open the branches, we are surprised. The people have uh, you know, flocked to the bank. And then we, we gain a lot of the customers. And, and even right now, we have almost, uh, you know, within the one, one and a half year period, we all, almost have uh, uh, the uh, have uh, uh, almost a half a mil, uh, half uh, almost uh, a million customer with us already, and we keep on applying, and then that's the reason why we want to be more stronger in the retail banking. By next year, I think we are going to multiply the 100 plus uh, branches we are with us. So that that is the one of the uh, experience with us. I think uh, the going on the the second point, uh, secondly that. The, the role of the central bank itself, you know, in the past is very passive. And uh, uh, with, with the uh, coming of this uh, new government, uh, we want the central bank to be more proactive in the sense that uh, we are just framing the new central bank law, which is going to enjoy a little dependency uh, to, to from away from the, uh, from the Minister of Finance. Uh, well, uh, I don't want to offend my... Uh, you know, uh, Minister of Finance here, because uh, when you say independence means, you know, we are not fighting each other, you know, the, if, uh, with the Minister of Finance and the Central Bank itself. Uh, I'm also advisor to the uh, Minister of Finance, and, uh, and I hope uh, it's not facing my excellency, <laughs> my boss. <laughs> uh, well, uh, actually, the, we are, what we are working towards the cent uh, Central Bank independence is, uh, you know, it's of uh, having a check and balance. System and we are going to go at a degree of uh, independency, and we are not saying that uh, it's going to be an outright independency. It's a sort of uh, autonomous status we are going to. Uh, this central bank is going to enjoy. So directly accountable to the president uh, in, in the first in the first instance, and then later on accountable to the to the parliament or the pidulodo itself. So uh, my final point is uh, the uh, the as I said, we are still in a learning process. And uh, before that, uh, we tried to modernize our financial services for the moment. And all the banks uh, are bent on the, having this, uh, you know, the, we, have, uh, we already have uh, the, the uh, uh, contacted with a number of uh, uh, banks in the area to, 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 to have a corresponding bank relationship. And we have uh, installed the ATM system, already a small in number. And uh, we already have the ATM outside, and uh, the, our banks have installed the uh, with another two banks, uh, and uh, I think as uh, Peter has just said, uh, we we have to. Uh, uh, I have to apologize if you find it a little difficulty to uh, getting the cash from this ATM using the, uh, the Visa card. It's because not because of the Visa, not because of the machine itself, but because of the weather. The weather is playing havoc. <laughs> so please excuse us for for uh, for any difficulty you face. Uh, and I think you agree with me. <laughs> So uh, for the moment, uh, in modernizing the, uh, our banking system, the service itself, 
Well, we have we have already have come up with the team up with a number of banks in the area, uh, including Kosokom Bank and uh, other banks. Uh, there. But but uh, what we are finding it difficult is uh, what, why we don't understand is why the Western banks are not coming, including the Charter Bank, Standard Chartered. But uh, we where the Standard Chartered is already present here. We have a very uh, uh, fruitful discussion, but uh, their presence is not uh, keenly felt here. Uh, and I be uh, in, in you know the uh, inviting them to come back home because, uh, as you know very well, the Standard Chartered Bank was born itself in, in Myanmar. If you stay literally in some way, if I'm correct, it's uh, 19, uh, 1862. So, uh, so we would like to welcome back the Standard Chartered Bank to us, and also other banks uh, uh, in the region, and not only in the region but also from uh, international banks. And uh, the fact that the, we are the main challenge for us is uh, capacity building itself. Because we are so far away from the international banking community, community as I said, we are still in a learning process. Uh, and in fact, uh, some of uh, the banks, including our own banks, we are trying to hiring some of the uh, bankers in the region. And, and it is one way of uh, you know, solving the capacity development efficiency. And uh, I think uh, we also going along with uh, some of the, uh, say, uh, we already set up the MBU, Myanmar Payment Union. You know, just to team up with the, uh, some of the, uh, the payment system, like the Visa, the Master Card, and then we're also going to team up with the GCP from Japan and uh, China Union Pay uh, in the very near future. So uh, on the whole, I think uh, the, we are just an infant, you know, the learning uh, infant where we're trying, trying to uh, crawl and trying to stand up. So I hope uh, very much, uh, you know, we want to learn a lot from the region a lot from my own, uh, you know, the uh, prominent uh, uh, the, the persons here, and I hope uh, they will render us a lot of uh, advices uh, uh, for the moment. Thank you. Thank you for welcoming us back. Yes, we did start here 150 plus years ago. We've been here 110 of those 150 years, and we look forward to our next 150. Uh, let me now introduce you to Thura Ko, who is the Managing Director of YGA Capital Limited Myanmar. Turaco is the rapporteur, and uh, what he will do in that role will be to do a video, I think, of the key themes of this session after the debate and put that out. Uh, and may I turn to you, Tura, for uh, the first question towards the audience. I'll do a video, and then if I can sell it, I'll sell the DVD as well. <laughs> But um, thank you, Jasper. This is a topic that's um, taken up uh, a lot of my time over the past, uh, a lot of my company's time over the past uh, several months because we have been working with the Central Bank of Myanmar and uh, His Excellency's Ministry to try and bring financial inclusion uh, into uh, Myanmar here by bringing a micro banking model that we've successfully invested in Indonesia. And I know a number of other um, colleagues of ours uh, have been trying to do this as well. And as part of this, and uh, this is uh, framing the first question I have, as part of this, we did a survey of uh, street vendors and market vendors in Yangon, Mandalay, and Mongyua, which is a second tier city in middle Myanmar. It took us about three months, and we went through uh, 500 vendors in total. And one key question was how familiar they were with the banking services and the banking systems here. And uh, three key conclusions came up. And practically none of them uh, really did not use banks apart from remittances, um, just wiring money from, uh, between families from one branch to another. But three conclusions came out of that and for the, uh, why they did not use banks. Number one, um, physical access. Uh, there was physical access and uh, just vendors having to open at 6 a.m., 7 a.m., and then close well after 6 p.m. means they cannot go to banks um, during opening hours, um, plus also the physical lack of bank, bank branches nearby. Um, and of course, that's where technology and so on can overcome that. Um, the second reason was it was far too cumbersome. Uh, it, they were fearful of walking into these banks. Um, the forms that they have to fill out, the questions that they're asked, um, they simply didn't understand it and they just felt it wasn't for them. Um, so making things simpler uh, and less cumbersome um, 
And, and that's where actually on technology, uh, the Philippines has done a great job using SMS to remit billions of dollars uh, in simple um, um, processes. But the um, third factor, and it's a key one and it's a unique one to us, and it's one that we must fix, is the lack of confidence and trust in the banking systems. And there's been a lot of history on this. We've had bank runs and we've had uh, government uh, making uh, uh, demonetizations in the past and so on. So people have been fearful of using the banking systems. Um, and that is uh, incumbent perhaps on the banks as well um, to be um, more prudent in their lending. Um, in the past, banks used to lend within their conglomerates and, and so on. So to uh, um, consider Hong's points, uh, risk um, is an important matter for banks. But uh, really, that's the question that I would like to pose. How do we build back confidence in the system. Um, part of it is, of course, a lot of it is regulation and the central bank, um, but also a lot of it is banks. Um, and then when technology comes, encouraging people to use it and to have trust, whether it's plastic or whether it's uh, mobile banking as well. So I'll open with that, if I may, Jasper. Thank you, Tura. As I suspect with all questions, Minister, your yes. response will always be very well received. So right. may I ask you to respond first? Thank you, Sandra. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say we want to examine, we want to check to the root cause why the people don't want to use bank systems. Because I think that most of our people are low-income people. That's one of the root cause. How low-income people can go to bank to save money or something that use money. This is the one of the key factors. I think that, but it may be right or wrong. I'm not sure. Because you mentioned that another thing, low-income people, or on the other hand, we can say it's a low, the poor people, or maybe that like that. I can say. They have lack of knowledge about the financial services, access to financial services. And sometimes they have lack of identity. And some we are lack of branches in rural areas. So this is very reasonable. And lack of confidence. You mean confidence and trust. It's very fundamental and very uh, right solutions. So we have to encourage, to eng educate or financial literacy is very important, I think that. We should educate to the grassroots levels for th about the financial services. At the same time, from my point of view, we have to build, we have to establish, we have to develop the infrastructures. Now we go, most of the people, they want to keep their money in their own safes rather than in banks. This is <coughs> confidence and also very easy to use money in their own safes. So if one of the low income people, they have a maybe account in the banks, they have to go to the banks and so many things to do. Most of our peoples have more, many difficulties, many needs, food and clothes, and other things we have to consider that. So that's why we want to develop or we want to try to reduce the poverty alleviations. So that's why financial access to financial services can help to reduce 
the poverty elevation, I, I can think that, because microfinance and others, maybe small and medium enterprises, financing, there's something like that. So that's why we are trying to increase the capacity of our banks, and on the other hand, at the same time, we have to educate the people to use banks. I, I mean, this is the financial literacy. This is my point of view that. So maybe other can discuss and other can have some different views. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Wood. One of the banks, uh, bankers like to say something. I hear the secretary put his hand up, please. Well, in, in the Philippines, we have uh, taken for granted this problem of uh, uh, lack of trust uh, uh, in the banking system because we've had uh, a central bank that has been performing very excellently in uh, exercising its uh, regulatory as well as its oversight functions in ensuring that we have, uh, in ensuring the stability and the uh, integrity of uh, the banking system. I think that's very critical, the role that uh, central banks play in, in promoting this. The problem of uh, financial exclusion in the Philippines has more to do with the high incidence of, uh, of po poverty, uh, which, in, which in itself is also a reason why, despite the robustness of uh, uh, the banking system's branches and ATM branches, they have actually been limited uh, to town centers and, and urban areas and have not been able to spread out to where they are needed most. Our experience recently with the uh, uh, conditional cash transfer program that we have been vigorously implementing uh, has, has given us a lot of lessons about how, how to promote uh, financial inclusion. Uh, when we started out with uh, CCT, there were just about 800,000 families uh, and about 10 billion pesos invested in the program. And when we, the president took over, he instructed us uh, uh, to make sure that by the end of his term, by the end of 2015, that we would have been able to service about 4.6 million uh, indigent households. Uh, and initially, the World Bank was uh, reluctant uh, to agree with us on that target, but when we begin to move from uh, cash-based uh, delivery of, uh, of uh, the cash subsidies to ATMs, uh, there was a dramatic increase in uh, the ability of uh, the program to reach uh, the poor. But still, ATMs limited us to town centers and uh, urban centers until uh, we begin to, until we discovered uh, mobile phone uh, banking. Uh, which uh, allowed us to reach uh, the poor via gasoline stations, grocery stores, uh, cooperative bank, uh, cooperative, cooperatives of, of farmers using a mobile phone. And because of that, this year, uh, we will be able to reach 3.8 million households uh, investing uh, 44 billion pesos, more than a billion uh, dollars uh, for this program. And, 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 and now we're realizing that we have here a mechanism that allows us in, a, in an alternative way to reach the, the very poor because uh, uh, this program reaches the extreme poor. And uh, there is another layer of uh, you know, the near poor who are also vulnerable. You know, just one flood can uh, uh, push them down to the level of being extremely poor. And so I think uh, uh, this, this mechanism we feel is going to make a very big dent on the uh, problem of uh, poverty and, and the government's ability to uh, reach the poor, which, by the way, for the first time in our history, it was very critical for us to be able to uh, uh, identify who the poor are and where the poor are because, you know, the prevalence of political patronage sometimes distorts, uh, you know, the ability to effectively reach uh, the poor. So this experience uh, is leading us to move in other direction because we believe that uh, the role of government in business, while critical, can also be limited in reaching the very poor so that it's important really to develop alternative financial institutions to get to the poor 
because we, we do have development banks owned by the government, but since they operate within central bank rules, you know, they, they, they have to abide by the strict, in strict, stringent rules of the central bank and they're less uh, risk averse. But, you know, transacting with the poor entails risks and it, it's really important for alternative financial institutions to be developed like uh, uh, microfinance, micro guarantees, and micro insurance uh, groups. And, and this is what uh, we're tapping for the coming rounds of uh, our uh, social programs in the Philippines. Thank you, Secretary. Just a thing about policy on that. It's, it's, a, you know, it's having an appropriate level of regulation and, and not over, overdoing it. It's a proportionate risk policy. So, you know, the world's got tied up with KYC and AML and FATF and all of that stuff. We got ourselves into a mess such that we cannot deliver basic technology because of these rules. And the greater benefit that's there and is available to us is delayed while people try and figure out whether, some, you know, a poor person who is dealing with small amounts of money should have the same level of risk diligence as a you know international you know large volume cash transfer system, so I think you know you need to stick your neck out and make some choices. If poverty alleviation, which I believe is the number one priority here, you can tell FATF how you're going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Uh, why don't we open up for some questions from the audience, and then we can come back. Uh, okay, we've got a lot of hands up, but why don't we start here? If we can get a mic here. Then we'll move it around. Thanks, Jaspal. Uh, you know the model financial inclusion means that you have to. Uh, you have. Could to I grow. request you yeah. just say your name and? Yeah, where I'm you... Pranjal Sharma from India. Uh, I want to understand what kind of model would work in Myanmar because financial inclusion means that you have to ensure that most people have access to finance, either a deposit or credit, almost immediately to reduce and minimize uh, inequity in the in the country. What kind of model will work? Business correspondence, microfinance, mobile uh, banking. There are several models in play across the region uh, from South Asia to East Asia. What do you think could work? Okay. I, yeah. Well, uh, <clears throat> uh, I think uh, is, uh, that, that uh, what your question is, uh, is, thing, uh, is partly answered by uh, Excellency because uh, the for one thing, the, we, are, we, we already permitted the under microfinance law, which we prescribed about uh, one year ago. And uh, a lot of these microfinance institutions are in place now. And uh, the one thing that uh, the, we need to know is, uh, you know, by you know, microfinancing, it's a way of, uh, you know, the, say, the, 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 those that the, the living in the rural areas or even the urban areas, you know, the, 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 the they, 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 they intend to have the knowledge of the, uh, of the, of the banking itself and the basic level. So uh, I think the, the microfinance uh, or the micro institution, uh, the, the fact that institution is also one of the uh, uh, basic thing that we should uh, be educating the people, you know, how to use the banking system, you know, from the bottom up, you know. So, uh, so uh, coming up with the, the, to, to the, uh, the issue of the confidence, uh, the, uh, I, I think the uh, secretary is right that the, uh, I think go along with him because the role of the central bank is very extremely important. Uh, I have a own experience about a few months ago when the rumors started to create uh, with my bank, you know, KB is a bank, and there was a withdrawal. Uh, we lost about the one percent of the deposits at that time in uh, in one or two days, and then I come up with the uh, as the excellency because. You know, the, uh, the central bank is not yet independent. We have, all we have to ask is the Minister of Finance. So the Excellency is very kind enough to, to, to render us assistance, and we met the press. We then met the press, and then we cleared out these uh, rumors outright. At the time, I remember, you know, the, I, I told the press that, you know, the media, that uh, I used to sleep uh, eight, hours a, uh, eight hours a day or at night. But I never sleep, I never lost my sleep, even during, during this crisis. I mean, it's a mini crisis, you know. So, so I, I told them, it's because uh, the, uh, in the past, we have the experience that, you know, even by now, uh, whenever the crisis come up or when the difficulties come up, 
it's always the uh, central bank that's uh, come up uh, uh, with, the, with, the, with the help or assistance we need. So what we need is the, the role of the central bank is to be more, you know, the, the, to, it should be a you know, rapid uh, decision, you know, on the spot decision that should be made without delaying action. That's why I said the central bank should be more proactive rather than uh, more remaining more passive. It is very important. So I can go along with the secretary, the role of the regulatory board. It's very important uh, in, in uh, creating the, uh, in, instilling the confidence uh, of the people uh, with regard to the banking, Thank uh, you. banking transaction. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a question here. What we will do is since so many hands are up, we'll take a few questions and then probably bring it to the audience so we have a thematic answer there. Please. Yeah, I'm uh, Christian Mandel from France. Um, in Nigeria, they uh, have about 70% of people who, who do not have uh, bank accounts, and they have launched a pilot project, which is to uh, combine national ID cards with uh, debit cards. And that allows people to uh, withdraw money, make deposits, uh, make small payments, but also to receive uh, social benefits uh, through this uh, payment card. So if you renew a national ID card every uh, five years, you could, within five years, have uh, 60 million people with uh, payment card. So is that an option for Myanmar? Very good idea. Uh, we come here, the side. Can we get the mic here? Right here. Front, front, second row here. Okay, we've got it there. Why don't you give the mic there? Yeah. Hi. My name is Abrar. I'm from Pakistan. There's no question, but just a few comments on some of the things that you know, all the gentlemen have been saying. Uh, first, on the KYC, I think our central bank has, has been very innovative, and that's something that we can probably, you know, uh, Myanmar can also learn from them, uh, that they have allowed us to go out and offer branchless banking, which is correspondent-based banking, uh, that allows us, first of all, to take the reach of the banking to the far-flung areas, but they've also allowed us to open low KYC accounts. So there are various tiers of accounts that they've allowed us to open. So a person can come to a shop, they can open an account with extremely low KYC. Practically no paper needs to be filled. It's all a virtual process that happens. So that gives them an opportunity to experience banking. And then we allow them to operate those accounts through various channels. They have mobile as an option, they have plastic as an option, and other channels are also available. Another thing that, uh, that we have seen work very well is that we work with the government of Pakistan to facilitate lots of G2P payments. Then we have been working with lots of UN agencies to, to facilitate cash transfers and social transfers through these agents who are available in the remote areas. What that has done in our experience is created a lot of confidence in those people, in the, the financial system as well as in those agents as somebody who is trustworthy because they get their money from them every month on a regular basis. So what we are now seeing is a trend that those people are now starting to actually actively open accounts at these agent locations, and they are starting to use these accounts for saving money, for paying off their bills, for sending money to their relatives, and, and they're actually starting to use these for making small retail payments as well. So probably those are some of the things that can come in handy as Myanmar is developing their plans for forward. Thank you. Thank you, Abrar. Those are excellent. One sec. We've got the gentleman behind that will come to you. Yes. I'm Arno Ventura. I'm a YGL. I had the opportunity, the opportunity yesterday to talk to the finance minister, but I have a precise question now. I'm um, the founder of Planet Finance Group, a microfinance group. We invest uh, in emerging country in the setup of new microfinance bank. I think Myanmar has set up a new uh, microfinance law, which is already a, a very first good, good step. But we have seen worldwide, and specifically in the regions, most countries allowing, through regulation, the setup of microfinance bank that can um, extend loans, not only micro, but also SME loans. While here in Myanmar, we have seen that uh, the regulation doesn't allow to give loans be beyond $500, while many uh, micro and small enterprise needs loans beyond $500. The regulation doesn't allow also to get access from uh, loans from international financial institutions, nor from uh, uh, the bank or in a very limited manner. I would like to know whether there are uh, plans to improve the regulation in the current uh, months or in the current years, so that local 
or international investors such as us, which are specializing in microfinance, can consider investing in uh, Myanmar. Thank you. Thank you. The lady here. Hi. Um, my name is Wen Wen I'm from Myanmar. Um, concerning, uh, okay, going back to Kotura's uh, survey research of why people are not using banks in Myanmar. So I think uh, I think there are two points points of views. Um, one is whether our current banks are, are providing the services that people require, and the second point of view is that are there um, the, uh, the players in the primary banking sectors? Uh, are, uh, there are not many players in the primary banking sectors, and currently. Uh, banking sector is very highly restricted. Uh, it's only uh, restricted to a few players, and and, and for the local companies, uh, private companies, they are not able to participate in the in the banking activities. And we are hearing that uh, the uh, we, the government will allow uh, foreign companies, foreign banks, to operate after 2015. But then, but then. We still do not see or, or do not uh, get any sense that whether the government will allow local companies to participate in the banking industry, and, and we understand that government is taking a um, uh, slower approach because uh, uh, they want to be very cautious because of the past bad experiences and past crisis. But then, uh, but then since the banking development is key to the eco uh, economic development. Is this cautious harming the development of the country? That's my question. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take one from that side since we've, we've done a lot this side and we'll take that as the last and come back and can see if we have time for the last one. Uh, yes, please. Uh, I'm Teng Tan Do from Myanmar. Uh, I would like to ask that uh, for the mobile, many mobile wallet operation, uh, which kind of organizations should be able to do? Banks or non-banks, financial institutions or mobile operators? This one question. And another question is that the, uh, the regulations. Now the existing regulation cannot uh, be enough for the, this new uh, services. This is a really new uh, service for our country. So how the regulation should be? I mean, uh, in the beginning, it should be very restricted or it should be start with uh, some uh, general one and can amend according to the experience. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Th those were very rich comments and questions. Uh, let me sort of bring it back to the stage so that, uh, and if we have time, we go back. Um, Minister, we won't trouble you this time for answering, uh, but we do want you to take away some very useful suggestions on the Nigeria experience of having a card, identity card, which has got an embedded chip, which then allows you to transact financially, but also to receive subsidies and grants from the government. So I think it's very powerful, it's proven, it's there to, for you to learn. The other very good uh, uh, idea from Abrar, uh, which was really about have tier KYC, and let's not use one um, uh, sort of quote for everyone and sort of have it properly, particularly for the low income accounts, there has to be some incentive uh, for the banking sector. Uh, but let me sort of um, go a little bit to the bankers uh, and uh, talk about uh, uh, two things. Uh, the first thing is, I think there was uh, from the local resident lady here, a question on competition, local versus foreign. Uh, is one angle of her uh, question. But the other question was, we're not getting sufficient services as well. So, you know, so we need more expertise, but is it right to bring in foreign competition at this point? And may I ask the bankers, I mean, you're from a vested interest point of view, and we'll hear from Thailand with real experience where it has actually happened sure. in whichever order you would like. Well, if I wear my hat of being one of the foreign banks, I would say yes, just open up as quickly as possible, but 
that's not going to be the case. Because I think banking is so important for, for, for the economies. And I think uh, a country should be uh, very cautious uh, on, on opening up the banking sectors. Because uh, you certainly want to, uh, to have some controls over how the banking is going to be conducted and how, how the resources of the country, financial resources, should be directed to to ensure that uh, uh, certain development need to be uh, need to be done together with the development of our banking systems. For example, in Thailand, uh, in the past, uh, we have uh, regulations that if we open a branch, and this is imposed on just the local banks, if we open a branch in a city, one branch in the city, three branches in rural areas. Also. There are certain countries who said the same thing about like uh, the electronic cash deposits and, and withdrawal systems. If you want to install in a in a supermarket, then probably you also need to install certain numbers in the places that you usually would not want to do. And this is a kind of regulations you might want to to impose uh, to actually. Uh, to, to uh, response to your need on, on inclusiveness. And, and that usually I found, my, based on Thailand experience, it works best when you work with the local banks, not the foreign banks. The foreign banks will start yelling, oh, no, 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 we, we can't take all, all of that. And, and, uh, so, and also, uh, banks have a crucial role in allocating credits to companies, and you want to make sure that they do it right. They do it in the, direct, in the same direction that you want to develop your private sectors, uh, and that would be done via a close cooperation uh, from the uh, finance ministers, economic ministers, and the banking systems. So I think uh, introducing competitions introducing uh, newcomers uh, are beneficial. Don't get me wrong, okay? And you should do that. But uh, you should also uh, clearly define the roles of, of the local financial institutions, which has already been here, uh, which has already doing uh, good business with good intentions. And I think they, they are willing to, would be willing to uh, work together with you to develop it further. Uh, okay. uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think just in the interest of time so that we can address all the questions raised, I would request the panel members to be very brief in their response, but crisp as well. And uh, Uthanwan, would you like to add to the competition versus the services gap? You yourself, yes. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> well, uh, the when I think uh, starting with the the question of uh, you know by the by the lady that uh, you know that uh, the, the people are not using uh, the banking uh, you know the system at the moment it's only partly true because when we try to offer the new products you know say it's, uh, something like uh, ATM uh, cards debit cards so people have to you know the the, the uh, to open the accounts with us. So in our experience, uh, you know, the, we are gaining a lot of uh, customers. For example, even in our main branch in, in the Kamayo, you know, we already have uh, 100,000, you know, customers with us. Uh, it's a one branch alone. So uh, it is a tremendous increase uh, within the past uh, past year or so. So uh, I think that may be partly true to the, uh, you know, the, the people are becoming aware to bank with us because of the new requirements for the new products they are using. And then uh, when, when we team up with the, uh, you know, the uh, Visa and also with the uh, uh, Western Union, uh, we are receiving a lot of remittances from abroad, you know, the, like, like uh, some, somewhere around uh, 70 countries uh, all, all, all over the world. So in one way, uh, you know, the, the, those who are recipients, the matter of fact, uh, also have to open accounts with us. Uh, said, you know, any, any, anything that... Uh, being, uh, you know, sort of uh, one way of modernizing the economy and uh, even in the far-flung uh, area, 
because we have uh, all the branches all over the country, it means that uh, they, they can uh, use our banking services. Uh, in the That's why I say whenever we open uh, branches, people are flocking uh, to, to, to the banks, because not because of the, because they, they, they have the, in mind uh, the new products they are, they, are, they are going to use or they, they, they need to use. So that's one way of, uh, of the thing, I think, to counter your, your, uh, your assertion that uh, because uh, it, it's, it's only for the, uh, maybe true partly in the, only for the local here in Yango. It's not uh, in the, in all the, all the, uh, throughout the country. Uh, Thank throughout you. The country. Thank you. Secretary, I'll come to you with the next question, and it's really around uh, microfinance. Uh, you know, Myanmar has had a situation where for many years there was one dominant player here which had 90 plus percent of the market share. They've now opened it up with 140 new registrations. Uh, but the worry is that because it is now open to NGOs and cooperatives and businesses, that there will be a rule trying to fit to the lowest common denominator. And where is the rule, role of the regulator and the government in this? Is it to uh, go one extreme of consumer protection, or is it to let the economic model thrive? And I guess that's the question that came from the micro credit there. And, maybe from your experience in Philippines, I'll be happy to share. Yeah, it, it really depends on what the object of uh, the financial inclusion program is because uh, the type of intervention really depends on the uh, clientele that you're trying to address. Uh, for example, if you're dealing with, and it's important to have a really nuanced uh, understanding who, of who the poor are because, for example, you're dealing with extreme poor or, or, or the layer of poor people just above them, the near poor, uh, I don't think that uh, many of these uh, uh, interventions, especially from the bank, uh, because of uh, risk averseness, the, the cost of uh, retailing uh, uh, banking services, and simply physically the absence of those facilities in their areas uh, makes the banks uh, uh, unable to reach them. That's why uh, Microfinance uh, groups and alternative uh, financial institutions uh, may be the key. Uh, in the Philippines, we have uh, one group called CARD. Uh, they have a clientele of about 600,000 uh, uh, people, mostly women, and every year they have a turnover of about 8 billion pesos, and their rate of repayment is about 99%. So they, they've proven effective uh, in terms of uh, that type of intervention. Of course, in, in government, we want uh, more scale because the president's committed to having, you know, cutting uh, poverty in half uh, by the time he exits uh, uh, his office. So uh, the question now is, uh, you know, to what extent are microfinance groups uh, present, uh, especially in the poor rural areas where the high incidence of poverty is, is, is found? So I, I think the challenge is really with, the, with these types of groups. And, well... You know, in the Philippines, we, we, we rank uh, top 10 in terms of uh, uh, creating an environment for uh, microfinance groups uh, to thrive. And uh, so uh, the potential is there. But, but apart from uh, the interventions like microfinance, especially in dealing with the uh, this lowest rank of uh, what we categorize as poor, I think it's also important for government side by side with uh, microfinance programs to uh, provide a sustained uh, social protection program because uh, many of these poor people uh, live in geohazard areas, uh, speaking for my country. And even if, you know, once they've been able to start a business but, uh, you know, the place gets flooded, then th that whole venture uh, uh, crashes. So it's important also for government to be able to extend uh, social protection services to the very poor that uh, you want to address. Thank you, Secretary. Um, we are also being very well tracked by Google and Twitter as we speak and have been in anticipation of this session. So I have picked uh, one question uh, which has come out very prevalently through the Google and Twitter in one way or another, and I'll address that to the Finance Minister uh, for his response because I think it is very relevant. And what they have to say in Google is that they think Myanmar is better off without banks. <laughs> worldwide, worldwide banks have done more harm than good now. And uh, the Twitter is that 
Making a shift from a cash to a banking system will require huge investments in transactions, in new systems, in the learning and relearning. And would this cost outweigh the benefit having learned from the worldwide experience? So Minister, why do you even bother to move from a cash to the bank economy? I'm very pleased to say because today I got so many experiences, so many <laughs> comments and very good times for me. And I'd like to say we have a, uh, plans, plans have been made for the greater outreach of banking services through such measures. Uh, the, 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 the more one is opening more branches in rural areas in each and every part of the country that this is our intention. And we would like to promote mobile banking. And we will encourage the savings. And we will initiate the electronic banking or mobile banking. And we enhancing the payment system, the payment and settlement systems. And we would like to allow to install auto clearing house because the, the payment and clearing system is very important for our financial assets. And we want to enhance our capabilities of the microfinance institutions. This is our idea. So I, I receive your comments from the treaties and the So I'm very happy with that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Uh, clearly, we had uh, many hands up still for questions, and that is, I think, uh, a reflection of the interest in the session and a tribute to the panelists uh, for having made such uh, valuable comments and remarks uh, to, as opening and then to your questions. Um, I would like to close the session to maintain my credibility with the World Economic Forum right on time at 6 p.m., which is a minute away. And all I have to say in the last minute is that Myanmar has all the advantages of being able to create the rules. They are not living under the challenges of a system or of existing legacy rules. They can create them. They can import the 21st century technology of choice and leapfrog. They can license the players of choice of world repute and successful track record. They have a lot of learning from the successes and the failures of people closer to them and further away to gain from. And they have the power of the ASEAN unification, which they honorably chair in 2014 to take them ahead. I look forward, along with all of you, to see how financial inclusion in a sustainable way takes shape in Myanmar over the next few years. Thank you. Thank you to the panelists and thank you to the participants.